Recent changes to copyright rules in Europe are designed to better compensate artists whose work fuels the revenue earned by digital platforms such as YouTube. But some have expressed concern that the new regulations will stifle innovation and free speech. As Canada updates its own copyright regulations, should these new rules serve as a roadmap? Well, let's find out. Joining us now in Berlin, Germany via Skype, there's Cory Doctorow. He is author of Information Doesn't Want to Be Free and most recently a novel called Walk Away. And here in our studio, Miranda Mulholland, member of the musical duo Harrow Fair and founder of Roaring Girl Records. And Donald Kwan is here. He's composer at Q Music Inc., previously a member of the rock bands Lighthouse and I.I., among others. And we are delighted to welcome you two, uh, I think for the first time, to our program here in our studio. And Corey, it's nice to have you on the line uh, all the way from Berlin uh, to join us again. And I want to start with you, Corey, because let's, you know, as, as the guys uh, Woodward and Bernstein used to say, we're going to follow the money here. So let's start with the money. Uh, there was a piece in the Toronto Star recently um, suggesting that Canada's artistic middle class, uh, on average, makes $9,380 a year. That's the average income from writing. On the other hand, there's a job search website that lists the average author's salary in Canada as nearly $62,000 a year. And uh, my first question to you is, which of those sounds more accurate to you? You know, I don't know what a what a writer what they're using to define writer in either of those um, capacities are. I mean, when you look at, for example, the advance on a first novel out of a New York publisher, it stayed more or less static in the science fiction field at six to seven thousand dollars for about twenty five years. Um, and so, I could certainly believe that people who are selling their first or second novel might might be earning in that range. I don't know what they call the middle class of writers, though. I mean, it's it's pretty clear that, like, at least in the fiction world where I live, almost nobody gets past their zeroth novel, and hmm. very few people who get past the zeroth novel make it to a second novel, and of the people who make it to a second novel, the vast majority don't get a third. Um, I think that's been true for a long time, and it's been driven by a lot of things, primarily concentration both in the publishing and the book-selling sector, uh, with an increasingly data-driven and therefore blockbuster-driven approach to publishing. Um, and you know the concentration has also given writers a lot fewer places to go when they get in bad odor with one or two publishers. Uh, with only five major publishers left, it's, it's become quite a squeeze. Well, let's go back almost a decade, and we'll talk about your own specific example when you wrote Makers. And you offered it up for free because, as you said at the time, my problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity which is a very good line. How did you bolster your income when you were just starting out as an author? Well, you know, I, I, I sold my first novel for, you know, the proverbial six to $7,000. It, uh, it was, that, that was 15 years ago. And uh, it was the first Creative Commons novel ever released. The publisher printed 10,000 hardcovers, which at the time was a very good run for a first novel. Uh, there were 30,000 downloads. The hardcover run sold out. The paperback is now in its 10th or 11th printing. Uh, I don't have another first novel I released at the same time without the Creative Commons license, so I, I can't tell you in any kind of imperial, empirical or rigorous sense how it did. But you know, I did a, a signing yesterday here in Berlin uh, that was absolutely packed. Um, you know, there were people sitting on the floor and, and in the hallway, and the people who came up afterwards overwhelmingly said, you know, I discovered your work because I was able to download it. I had never heard of you. A friend of mine recommended you. I never would have just gone out and picked up the novel, uh, but because I could download it, I got it. Now I own all your books, and here they all are, dog-eared and you know, uh, stained with with old curry verse. Will you sign them for me? Huh, so cool. uh, I, you know, I sold books. That's that's how I did it. I sold books. Gotcha, Miranda. Let's uh, focus the um, discussion now into your uh, line of work, which is music. The job search website we mentioned off the top gives this number for the average salary for a musician in Canada, $39,234 a year. How does that number translate into your world? Well, I looked at your website. I looked at that website. It's a job listing site. Um, and I would, I would discount that as a credible source. I, I, it, it, it comes from crowdsourcing. And for, for the author, actually, for Corey's, you know, they're... Uh, even an author having a salary is, is very rare, same as musicians. Uh, the Canadian Independent Music 
Association did a study in 2013 which put the number around $7,228. So that's quite a discrepancy. Although, again, $39,000 is, is, not, is not great. So uh, I would say that, first of all, just to debunk the, the Nouveau um, uh, number and, and focus on something that is actually what I'm kind of more what I'm hearing from my, my community, which would be around $7,000 hmm. $7,000. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard to make a living in this country as a Very musician. difficult to start, yeah. especially, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Donald, you've, uh, you've been around, as we suggested in the intro. You're <laughs> yes, uh, yes. 10 years with Lighthouse and uh, Lorena McKinnett's band and so on. And, um, why did you give up? Let's just do a little background here. You gave up performing at a certain point. How come? I fell into being a composer. A, a composer of music, and that made me much more money than being a performing musician. So I gravitated towards there uh, after my stint as a performing musician. Okay, so how do you make your living currently? Currently, I would say most of it, um, over 90% of it is um, royalties from my intellectual properties. 90% of it? Yes. So 90% of what you make today is royalties from stuff you have written in the past? In the past 25 years, yes. So copyright for you is huge. It's, it's, it's everything, everything. Huh. If I didn't have those rights, I couldn't even come close to who I am and, 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 and being a, a credible uh, composer this day if those copyright uh, rules weren't in effect. Miranda, how about for you? How much? How much does copyright matter to your bottom line? Well, it matters to me because it, it matters to my community. I think it, we're, we live in an ecosystem, so this is very, very important. For me, I've been a side person. I was in Great Lakes Swimmers for seven years. I've been in Bow Fire, which is where I met you. Uh, so, you know, the, my, most of my income comes from performing. This is a problem, though, because it means that if I ever wanted to take a break from the road, say, have a child, uh, and have some kind of time where I wasn't just paid for when I was exactly on the stage, mm -hmm. then uh, then loose copyright laws uh, don't allow me to have any kind of income coming back. You do scoring work? I do some scoring work, do, yeah. Do you get royalties for that? Uh, well, actually, it's a very interesting one because right now uh, I do a lot of work with composers, so I play for film and television. But in Canada, unlike 44 other countries around the world, uh, what, the performer is not paid for soundtracks. So I'm actually not hmm. paid when, uh, when anything I've played on is around the world. Anything that I've composed, I do get paid for, yes. Uh, can I pay you a compliment? <laughs> sure. I saw Please. I saw Bowfire oh. at Roy Thompson Hall. That was a phenomenal show. Thank you. You really rock it out there with that Thank fiddle. You. I got to tell you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we got off the path there, but since since we're not I'll paying take it. we're not paying your royalties, we can pay compliments anyway. Thank we you. Can I, do that. I appreciate it. Corey, let me get you back in here and talk about what's going on in Europe right now. There is a copyright bill before the European Parliament. Uh, they have been debating this for a while. It's it passed, I guess, this past year. And can you talk to us about the impact that 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 you think that will have on composers and authors. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's uh, great to talk about when copyright works, and I'm I'm also a great beneficiary of copyright that works for me. But obviously, not all copyright uh, does the same thing for everyone, and and it's possible to have a good copyright and a bad copyright, and it's possible to say bad copyright's a problem without condemning copyright per se. And I think this is one of those bad copyrights. It's a rule that says that if you have a platform where the public can talk to itself, where anyone can publish a work that might be copyrighted, you have an obligation to put up a crowdsourced database that anyone can anonymously add anything to. Uh, and if and they can say, that's my copyrighted work. And you're not allowed to deny anyone access to this database. If they falsely claim copyright, you can't bar them from adding new works later. So you could claim all the works of Shakespeare and then come back and do it again the next week. And then you have to censor anything that looks like it might match anything in that database. And that goes for still images, videos, photographs, uh, software code, text, uh, and, and anything else that seems to be a match. Uh, the database uh, doesn't exist. The filter doesn't exist. No one's ever built anything like this. Um, computer scientists are pretty skeptical that it can be built. I'm a pretend computer scientist. I have an honorary computer science degree. But you know, Tim Berners-Lee, who created the web, and Vince Cerf, who created TCP IP, and 70 other eminent uh, global computer scientists wrote a letter to the EU saying, we have no idea how to build this thing you're saying we have to build. 
And if you approximate it, it's going to catch a lot of tuna in the dolphin net. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, it's a problem because it's going to cost an enormous amount of money. And there's about five companies in the world with that kind of money. They're all giant U.S. companies. Uh, the European tech companies have all written to the, the parliament here and said, you know, we, the tiny Czech search engine, we, the Bulgarian photo app that rivals Instagram, we are all going to go out of business because none of us have five or 600 million euros kicking around to build this filter that you think we're going to use. Huh. All right. In which case, you, you're, you've heard what the European experience is with this, and you've heard Corey's response to what they've tried over there. Obviously, we're in the midst of this right now, too, and no doubt some people here are looking to Europe to see whether that's an example for what we should do. What are the lessons we ought to learn, Donald, in that case? Well, well they, they, they have, they've got it. They have the idea right. It's the implementation which is very, very tricky. As, as Corey said, that's the trickiest part of all of this. We can conceptualize all we want, but how do we actually manage to actually do what, what we know is needed? Um, and that's what's going to be the, the, the new thing over the next little while, is to figure out creatively how we're going to do, uh, accomplish that. I think the, 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 the concept is right, but how do we implement it? Miranda, you gave a speech recently, I think, were you, you were in uh, Geneva? Mm -hmm. Yeah, World Trade Organization. You gave a talk comparing all of this to Frankenstein. What did that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, so the World Trade Organization is on the banks of Lake Geneva. It's, it's an incredible building. And you can see right across the lake to Villa Diodati where Mary wrote, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, mm -hmm. um, starting a genre, which Corey's familiar with. Um, and one of the most amazing things about that book was she was living through the Industrial Revolution of her time, the first Industrial Revolution, and she saw the, what happens when um, there's progress that, that's unchecked, when uh, we don't use skepticism and empathy, when we're looking at new developments. Um, so, so what I was trying to do was just um, use this as a framework for approaching policy uh, where we want policymakers to apply skepticism, skepticism towards people who are saying that everything is fine, skepticism towards big technology companies, mm -hmm. and then apply empathy to the people who are going to be, who, ha who are going to feel the ramifications of this. So applying skepticism and empathy, and you will come up with a better policy rather than going forth and unleashing a Frankenstein into the world without actually mm -hmm. considering the consequences. There's this question of just because we can, should we? Doesn't mean we should. Exactly. So I think that that that's what I meant uh, with that with that comparison. And where are we right now in Canada in terms of like where on where on the continuum are we in terms of developing this policy? Uh, well, I, I think there were some pretty amazing things that happened in the EU actually, and um, one of the things that's very important for creators is that it has established the consent piece. So mm -hmm. it is saying. If your work is being commercialized on a site, uh, then you need you as a creator, you need to be able to give consent for that to happen. And you need to be paid fairly for that to happen. And if you do not give consent, then you need to be able to have it taken down in a meaningful way. So that that's very encouraging. And I'm feeling that that's being listened to. Yes. Uh, it's being listened to all over the world, in fact, in, in the US and here in Canada. Given the European experience then, Corey, what what do you think Canadian lawmakers ought to be truly focused on to make sure that they make the changes that you think ought to be made as opposed to the mistakes that you think have been made in Europe? Well, so I think that when we, when we make copyright, if we want copyright to benefit creators and not, say, media companies, because whatever's happening to creators' incomes, media companies' revenues are way up. So the share commanded by authors is declining. The share commanded by the big five publishers and the big four labels and the big five studios, soon to be four studios, all on the increase. And so whatever w we do, we should be aiming at increasing the negotiating leverage of creators over the industrial actors that they interact with. So, uh, I mean, it's nice to talk about consent, but that's not, a fact, in fact, what's been established. What's been established is that everybody's ability to speak on the European internet is now contingent on not being mistaken for something in a database that claims to be a copyright claim, but which has no evidence, right? It's, it's one thing to say, you need my consent to publish my work in a book. It's another thing to say, I'm allowed to go into any bookstore and just start taking books off the shelves and say, I published, I wrote those books, why do you have them there? And just walk out of the store 
having insisted that none of those books can be sold until they go out and, and figure out whether or not I had the claim. Normally, when we want to suppress speech, we require people to present some evidence of their claim. That's not what the European uh, rule has done. So you know, what can we do to increase the negotiating leverage of authors? Well, at its, at its peak, we wouldn't even talk about copyright. We talk about you know, the WTO. We talk about competition. And we'd say, let's end the 40-year period of antitrust malpractice that started with Mulroney and Reagan and Thatcher, break up the big publishers, break up the big labels, stop the Disney-Fox merger, require companies to compete with each other instead of buying each other, create a seller's market for our creative works so that we don't have to uh, shop among three or four big industrial actors that have converged on a single set of terms and instead be able to take our pick among them. And that goes for Google and Facebook too. They should never be allowed to buy their competitors. But if we're going to confine ourselves to copyright, then let's make copyright that increases an author's leverage. Let's create copyright that can be reclaimed. We have a 25-year uh, reclaim rule in Canada. Let's make it even more aggressive. Let's make it more available to more authors and more kinds of work. Let's um, uh, set some minimum contracting terms. Let's make work made for hire a lot harder to get a hold of. Let's make the playing field more, more level between players and, uh, or composers and performers. All of those things are things that meaningfully increase the negotiating leverage that authors have, that creators have when they walk into a contract negotiation. But um, you know, uh, creating rules like the new copyright directive that's going to lead to vastly more concentration in the IT sector where we're going to have much fewer companies that are much larger. You know, if you think Facebook is and Google are abusive bullies now, give them 10 years with no European competition because the table stakes just went up by $500 million to implement a new copyright filter and see how you like it. Those guys are going to be bigger, badder, and much harder to squeeze a nickel out of after a decade of, of copyright filtering. Hmm. Miranda, uh, I want to read you something here from Julia Reda. Uh, who is, um, I think with Corey, not all that impressed with some of the changes that have been made in, in the European Parliament. She represents Germany. She's a politician, represents Germany in the European Parliament. She had this to say, Internet platforms hosting large amounts of user-uploaded content must monitor user behavior and filter their contributions to identify and prevent copyright infringement. <coughs> Upload monitoring software cannot tell infringement apart from legal uses, like parody, specifically enabled by exceptions and limitations to copyright. Filters also frequently malfunction. As a result, legal content will be taken down. Are software limitations a sufficient reason for artists not to be well compensated for their work? I think that one of the biggest problems is that all those people who are responsible for those copyright filters don't want to pay people to do that. So they're trying to implement these software that maybe can't catch it all, these catch-alls. But I really think that that this fear mongering isn't helpful. I, 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 you know, we have history to show us since the beginning. We have, um, you know, the the printing press, the invention of the compass. We have history showing us that there are disruptions that happen, and then there's a time that shifts, and there are people who come in and try to uh, make money, monetize these kind of periods of disruption, and then regulation needs to set in. And fear mongering doesn't help. I don't. I don't. I, th I think that we're, the most important thing is that people in the EU, people in Canada, people in the US are actually listening now to creators. And that is the most important thing that we're seeing, the sea change that's different. We're in a post-Cambridge Analytica world now, in, in, a, in a skepticism of Facebook world. We're, we're, we're there now, and we're actually listening to creators. And, I, and I'm not a lawyer. I admit that. I have enough hats that I need to wear as a professional musician in order to make a living. But uh, we're seeing a real change for the better. And finding technical reasons to oppose this, I think, is just, is just ludicrous. Donald, you got a view on that? Um, I just, you know, the, the big companies are so big. Everything is so big. Social media is so big people involved who are listening. We used to be happy if a thousand people listened to our record. Now we're not happy until we have at least a million people listening to it. So, so everything is being done uh, with that perspective. Like, it's big. And I personally believe that a lot of this can be mitigated the more we bring in real people and not hand it over to computers and bots that can deal with the million hits at once. Well, can I ask you about YouTube then? Because yes, YouTube yes. obviously is an unprecedented opportunity for you to get your content in front of That's right. You know, vast numbers of people that you couldn't have before the internet exploded. On the other hand, 
you probably need a million views before you start to see any money at all. That's right. So talk to us about that balance. Um, so I personally think as a working musician, working composer, I, I think the future is, is kind of, I, I don't know if this is the right word, downsizing our expectations for how we make a living. <laughs> um, everything has, has alluded to that more is better. I need to sell a million records. I, we need to be a hit around the world. I personally say all this stuff is going to happen, and yes, I support everything that's happening with the, with, with the, the changes that are being made on our behalf. But as an com, uh, individual composer, I'm looking inwardly and saying, OK, let's step back, and how do I make a living? Hmm. And it's not anymore the only idea in my head, oh, I have to sell a million records. No, it's bringing back. It's selling 50 t-shirts at my concert. That's where I really start to make money. You add that up, and we're over the $40,000 a year we're talking about average income. Well, can I talk to you about that, Miranda? Do you, do you I mean, it's not enough, obviously, to sell tickets to a concert anymore yeah. or, or sell, like, uh, I mean, what we used to call records. Now, I guess they're called units. Or, well, vinyl's or, back, Steve. Vinyl's back. I know. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but are you in the t-shirt business now? Um, well, no, I'm not. I'm not. I know you're, 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 you're wearing Black Sabbath I'm, here I'm tonight. I'm rocking a 1979 shirt. Uh, no, I'm not in the t-shirt. Uh, I'm not in the t-shirt business. Um, I do feel as though we are close to finding some sort of a, 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 a market. What we want is a is a is a market marketplace. Mm -hmm. And you know, YouTube is is really our biggest disruptor in the marketplace because you know, while Spotify and Apple Music are trying really hard to pay creators and try to come up with some sort of uh, market share uh, version of what this is going to be or how it's going to be, you know, they're giving it away for free. So until we kind of figure that out, mm -hmm. you know, then we can kind of move forward as to what the streaming services are going to bring in or what they're, they're going to do. Of course, I have portfolioed my income, though, because I absolutely have to. Uh, a lot of it, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also, uh, you know, I play for hire, so I play with Jim Cuddy, or which I'm doing on Friday. I work for Soul Pepper Theater, and I, uh, I, I do, you know, I do so, I have so many hats again that I have to wear. But, hmm. um, but so far, not in the t-shirt business. So far, not. <laughs> no. Corey, can you tell us about where you? I mean, as you look at this, you have issues as an author. They have issues as musicians. Is, is there some overlap here, or are these two solitudes in the way that copyright handles these issues? Well, I think copyright handles all creative works in the same way, which is it's actually made a kind of nonsense out of copyright because we, we have the same rules to negotiate the rights of, of crossword puzzle authors as we do of science fiction novelists and scientific authors and, and musicians and so on. Obviously, all of our work has different contours because it is different. It's, it's creative, but it's not all the same thing. I think the one thing that we, that we do share in common, though, is that we're all bound by the same laws of physics and technology. Right, it, it, wanting it badly is not enough. You know, the reason that every single computer scientist who doesn't work for a company trying to sell something to the music industry says filters are impossible is because we don't know how to make them. Right, mm -hmm. shouting nerds just you need to nerd harder <laughs> will not make technology that no one knows how to build emerge. I don't know that the example of the printing press coming under control is the one that we want because the control that followed the printing press was the Inquisition. Right? I would hope that we could do something a little better than this. You know, what we know about filters is that when Yulia Rita wrote her article about filters, it was taken down by a filter that mistook it for copyright infringement. When I wrote an article about her article about filters being taken down, it was taken down by a filter because it was mistaken for copyright infringement. We know that uh, you, American cops have used false copyright claims to suppress video of police violence. We know that the King of Thailand used it to suppress video of a popular uprising. We know that American newscasters have made copyright claims automatically without any human intervention that took down NASA's own footage of the Mars lander. We know from experience it's not fear mongering, it's just, it's just history. We know from experience that if you create systems for suppressing speech with no penalties for getting it wrong and no checks and balances, that sloppy people and people who are not acting in good faith will suppress speech. And that's not good for creators either. We need a system that can take account of things like fair dealing, because this footage right now that we're recording includes that stock image of uh, Parliament behind you, and it includes the Black Sabbath album cover. 
And we don't want bots to say, I see two copyrighted works in this clip. It's a copyright infringement. Right? Those are fair dealing. They're incidental uses. And bots don't know the difference. And when a computer scientist tells you that we don't know how to make a bot that can understand that context, they're not doing it because they don't care about artists. They're doing it because they're deeply versed in the praxis of computer science, and they understand its limitations. Hmm. In which case, Miranda, how challenging is it going to be to get this right, given that authors, musicians, filmmakers, documentarians may not all be on exactly the same page here in trying to get their issues dealt with in one all-encompassing law? I mean, it sounds pretty challenging. It does. Uh, there are two things, though, that I think <clears throat> they, we have in common. Um, which is we want fair compensation for our creative work and the choice to whether monetize or not monetize. And we also want a functioning marketplace. We want somewhere that we are compensated or not compensated if you choose to not be compensated for your work on uh, it, up there. We want to be able to have a functioning marketplace. Those are two things that we have in common. And I don't think we have to look uh, any farther than the US, which is amazing. I mean, what's going on in the US right now and, and, and the bipartisan, uh, there was a bipartisan vote uh, that got the Music Modernization Act through. And sure, that's, that's music specifically, but that's a lot of different players at that table. And they voted that almost unanimously through. So I think we're at, we're at a time when there are a lot of common things that we are looking for. And you know, as any lobbyist will tell you, get unified on your front, and that's the way to move the needle in government. In which case, Donald, as we go through this exercise, should we be looking to the American example as opposed to the European one? I, I would say that we should be looking at, it's certainly at both, because even if they turn out with different results, we, as a third player, can actually take a look at what's happening and in our upcoming um, law issues, mm -hmm. we can learn from what we've seen and hopefully make ours even better than both sides. That is the hope. Can I thank Donald Kwan, president, composer, Q Music Inc., Miranda Mulholland, musician, Harrow Fair, founder of Roaring Girl Records, and Cory Doctorow, who's over there in Berlin, Germany, uh, writing, blogging, being his good old-fashioned activist self, and, and from time to time joining us here on TVO. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciated your time tonight. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.